Hallelujah. How's everybody today? Are you blessed and highly flavored? Praise God, you're to be the salt of the world, right? You know what salt does? It stings. Yeah. But it causes you to be thirsty. And it also preserves. Amen. You know, there are a lot of things that are happening globally. And God is trying to get his body to a position, not only of preparation, but of unity. Hallelujah. And, and in this area of what he is doing, there is a move of God that is getting ready to break forth. We see trinkles of it. Amen. Amen. But there is a move of God that's getting ready to break forth in a mighty way. So one of the things that God begins to do, he begins to shake and expose and so forth so that people come to repentance because without repenting for the washing of the blood, because the blood always goes before the spirit. Without repentance and, and walking away from wickedness and evil and, and, and our will and getting us to a place of um, relinquish of our own ownership so that we are owned by him. Revival can't move. Now, revival is not always in an area of just location. It starts with individuals. Amen. See, it first starts with a person within you. You know, unless you're thirsty and hungry for the presence of God, then revival doesn't come for you. It will pass you. That's why the Father says he searches those who will worship him in truth and spirit. How many of y'all want the Father to search you out? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so in that, God is trying to position his children into a place where it is no longer we that live but him that lives so that he can express himself through each and every one of us. There's something that's happening right now. The enemy always, listen, the enemy always tries to counteract or bring a false revival or something. That's why there's familiar spirits. Familiar spirits always like to act like the Holy Spirit. Amen. But if you're not in the spirit, you won't discern it. And one of the things that begins to happen is the enemy comes with an area of what we call false humility. That's what religions are, other false religions. There's false humility. You know, when I was in Cambodia, <clears throat> I, was, uh, I saw all of these Hindu temples and so forth and how they were worshiping uh, these statues and putting flowers on it and whatever. And, and it was nothing but false. But the people were sweet and humble, but it was false humility. And I thought, my gosh, Lord, look at and, and he kept showing me the arena, but look who they worship. I thought, yes, because of that, it brings them false humility. You know, the word says that the devil, Satan comes as an angel of light. That's in false humility. And we're seeing a lot of that all over. There's all kind. Jesus never brought religion. He brought his eternal presence, power, and truth. That's God Almighty. He brought the anointing. And through the anointing, you and I can overcome everything. But there's something important about when you begin to understand the purpose of the anointing. But there is false humility that prevents the anointing from moving in an individual's life. That's where individuals become pretenders. You know, God knows the heart, doesn't he? Everybody says, yeah, well, God knows my heart. Well, he does know your heart, but the problem is, is most people don't know them themselves. Right. Hallelujah. Go to Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2. False humility. We'll start at verse 1. <laughs> False humility. In verse 1, let's speak it together. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, <clears throat> if any fellowship of the Spirit, <clears throat> excuse me, 
if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being what? <clears throat> Like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now, he says something, he starts out, if any consolation, of any comfort of love, of any fellowship, in other words, he's saying, if you are maintaining these things, if you are maintaining these things, if you are maintaining fellowship with the Holy Spirit, if you are maintaining these things, you will become like-minded with the Spirit of God. Can you imagine if we were all like-minded? Wow. That's God's desire. His greatest desire as a father is that his children see what he sees. That is the greatest desire of a father, is that their children see what they see. That's the greatest desire for God, for me and you. In verse, thir in verse 3, let nothing be done through what? Selfish ambitions or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. He's explained in humility. Let each of you look out not for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in a form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking him a form of bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he did what? He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Now, this is powerful because he had to humble himself. Remember, he was God. And it took a lot of dying, didn't it? He could have just said, that's I'm done with them, kill everyone and start over again. Let's erase this universe. Let's erase time. Let's just do it over. We'll just wipe them out. But he's made us because he's love. God is love. He's the God of love. But where there's a God of love, there's a God of judgment and justice. He's the God of ju righteousness too. So he's trying to tell us, look at if you're maintaining this fellowship, if you're maintaining the place where you are in position, which is a fulfillment required by God, with the fruit of like-mindedness with my spirit, he said, you will maintain a place of humility, lowliness, others' interests. It is a state of humility. You know, we want to reach a level of like-mindedness with Christ. And it's going to take true humility, not false humility. Hallelujah. It's going to take obedience. It's going to take death to yourself, selfish wills and desires. We are now bond servants to Christ as Christ came as a bond servant. We are the likeness of Christ. <clears throat> Amen? We are to be rejecting false humility. We are to be laboring unto the Lord. <coughs> we are to be expanding this kingdom with a full desire in participation of the largest harvest ever to come. It's getting ready to happen. He is preparing his children. But see, there's too many people still out there playing religion. Too much religiosity, not enough relationship. It isn't about how many times you go to church. Amen? It isn't about how many times you read your... See, people try to do a justification, false justification, by how many times they read the Bible, how many times they pray, how many times they do that. See, it's all about I. Everything in the kingdom is position. And you only can get in position by denying yourself. The number one key. That's what Jesus said. I'll give you the formula. You want to follow me? You want to be like me? Deny yourself. Here's a shovel. Go bury yourself. And then pull the sword. Amen? Pull the sword out. That was, that's the cross. The sword in the ground is nothing. When you pull it out, it becomes a sword. And then Fight. And when you learn how to spiritually fight, then you'll be able to follow me. Other than that, you can't follow me. You'll be misled. You'll be making emotional decisions and living how, how you feel instead of what truth says to. Oh, hallelujah. First Peter chapter 5. You know, we're, people have a tendency to always look for better 
but they haven't fulfilled what God has given them already. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 5. <clears throat> and verse 5. Let's speak it. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves. Say what? Submit. Takes a lot of death to submit. Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, do what? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Don't exalt yourself. And promote false humility. <laughs> it says be sober. Which means alert. Be vigilant. Be cons consistent. Because the adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour or deceive or mislead. <clears throat> Resist him. Steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Everybody goes through it. I don't care how long you've been a believer. No one's made it yet. Amen? But if you're not an individual that is alert and consistent. Now, you, if you're not consistent, you can't be alert. You know, you must be consistent. Consistent in what? Consistent in getting in God's presence. That's the number one key. Consistent in getting in God's presence. Even the devil knows the word of God and he ain't carrying God's presence. Even demons know the word of God and they're not carrying God's presence. Even Jesus told him, you search the scriptures thinking you have salvation, but you won't come to me to get it. Amen? Amen. See, he wants relationship. It took a while for me to read the Bible. Because I, when my visitation from the Lord, he spoke to me. We communicated. I kept telling him, why do I need to read about you when you're here with me and I know you? But he kept bringing the Bible back to me. And I saw so many hypocrites and false humility. A lot of wannabes not willing to be. And he said, because I want you to begin to learn how to live out of my word. And my word will confirm my voice. And that's where people fall into a lot of familiar spirits because they don't confirm the voice that they hear with the word of God. And then familiar spirits come. And then a person, he, that person will live by how they feel. There's a lot of granolas out there that are called nutty and fruity. Because they live by how they feel. Oh, this was God. Man, I'll never tell you. Mom and I were at a, a meeting one time, and you might have heard this before. <clears throat> and this woman was talking about the glory of God is filling the room. Can you feel the heat? I said, man, turn the AC on. Open the vent. There ain't no glory of God. Nobody's just turned the AC on. It was a bunch of granolas. False humility. Puffed up. This is not what God is looking for. He's looking for humble, real people that love him with all of their heart. Humble, real people that are willing to deny themselves. Humble, real people that are willing to follow him. Go the extra mile. Come out from among the wicked. Come out from the unclean. Be sanctified unto him to where he is your source and your everything. Not just when you need him. You don't put him in the closet and hang him up Send them out to get dry cleaned. You don't open the closet door when you need them. He's in front of you. That's where the word says, I always set the Lord before me. That's who he's looking for. But so many people push him aside. I got this, Lord. Yeah, I'll call you when I, when I need you. That's not what he's looking for. Amen? Because the enemy comes. And he's not stupid. He'll outwit you without the Holy Spirit. But one of the things he does bring is false humility. Do you ever hear someone say, I humble myself? When people tell me I'm a humble servant, I want to throw up. Say puke. 
You don't, and don't go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, here comes your humble servant. You might hear a door shut. <laughs> you come humble, but you don't have to tell him you're a humble servant because then he says you're prideful. If you got to tell God you're humble, then you're prideful. Amen. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. True humility is suffering, is the suffering of the death of self. The suffering, rejecting the influence of the world. Submission to the call of Christ and maintaining and consistency. And of course, in your prayer, praise, worship, fellowship, with no excuses, which is the fruit of false humility. Does everybody get it? Excuses is nothing but a fruit of false humility. Always justifying and altering the will of God to focus according to their agenda and not God's agenda. That's called false humility. Colossians chapter 2. Hallelujah. You came for the truth, right? Colossians 2.16. Glory. False humility. There's a battle between false humility and true humility. In verse 16, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Verse 18, let no one cheat you. Let no one what? Cheat you, deceive you, mislead you, prevent you from getting somewhere. Let no one cheat you of your reward, which the Lord has. Take and delight in what? False humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he or she has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And not holding fast to the head, who is Christ, from the whole body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you what? Died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you still subject yourselves to regulations, religious regulations? Don't touch, don't taste, don't handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, they can't overcome. They can never overcome. So there's an area where people are able to maintain an area of strength in their own flesh, but they can never overcome. So you can be strong in the, in the flesh, but weak in the spirit. And that's more important. The place where the enemy tries to get you so that you're constantly relying on your own self, your own talents and own abilities, and not the Lord's. Does everybody see it? False humility. False humility is motivated by evil influence because hiding behind false humility is pride. It's all carnal wisdom and reasoning. Carnal wisdom and reasoning. If you maintain the death of self by self-examination, you're examining yourself, and you're comparing your life to the life of Christ and your death to the death of Christ, then the anointing is there. Does everybody get it? Then the anointing is there. See, everything revolves around the tabernacle and the anointing. Without the anointing, you and I are nothing. Nothing. Oh. There is no anointing like the unction that comes out of death. That's where the anointing comes from. Out of death. <laughs> false religions produce false humility with no anointing. There's no power. They got a lot of gossip. A lot of religious acts, 
They dress funny. No anointing, no power, no truth. Remember, the anointing is the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty. <clears throat> false humility, false peace, false doctrines, no power to drive out demonic forces. Because of false humility, false religion. That's what the enemy promotes. That's what you see everywhere. False humility. They say one thing, but they do another. That's what the Democratic Party is. <clears throat> Psalm 24. Now let's go to 2 Timothy first. Oh, hallelujah. That's what false religions are. The Democratic Party is nothing but a false religion. That's why they're called the left. They're going to be left out. Hallelujah. We'll wave by. No. I'll leave my prayer booklet. We better send it to them today. Hallelujah. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. Let's speak it. Therefore, if anyone does what? cleanses himself from his, the latter. He will be a vessel of honor, sanctified. Is God looking for sanctification? Yes. He will do what? If he what? Sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. If he does what? Cleanses himself from his past. Now that doesn't give you a right to sin in the present or in the future. Amen. But cleanses himself. You know what? You know that. You're right with God. And if you think you're right with God and everybody's telling you you're wrong with God, then you better find out what's going on. Because mostly everybody else will know whether, where you are. You may not, but everybody else will. Amen? So just ask someone. Out of the mouth of two witnesses, you'll know. Yeah, what do you think about me? And don't get offended when they tell you you're an idiot. And you're out of position. And you need to stop touching those unclean things. Don't be offended. Just take it joyfully and die. Hallelujah. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself for the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every what? Every good work. Flee also youthful loss. But pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a what? Pure heart. Your heart. See, false humility always has a hardened heart. Oh, it's got a pretender. It's like a fluffy cloud that's black, dark, evil, blinding. It isn't the same. Because the heart is hardened, but there's false humility there. But when the heart is pure, there's true humility. See, one of the things, the fruits of true humility is submission. You're no longer fighting for your life. You're fighting for his. You're not fighting for your presence and your will. You're fighting for his. Oh, glory. Let's go a little further. In verse 23. But avoid what? Foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their what? Senses. That means to see, to hear, and a humble arena to where they're able to receive. And escape the snare of the devil that they've been placed in, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Wow. False humility has a sense of obedience but hardened heart, can never go the extra mile or let go of the worldly entanglements. Says one thing, does another. Always protecting self-reputation while holding on to vengeance of evil schemes 
It is a mindset above others while true humility puts others first. Amen? Psalm 24. Psalm 24. <clears throat> God is a forgiving God. He's a loving Father. But, you know, we bring judgment on ourselves and the things that we do. False humility always blames everyone else for their stuff. Amen. Psalm 24 and verse 3, let's speak it. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place. That means in his presence. He who has what? Clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. How many of y'all know that we can be the worst idol? Nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord. And righteousness from the God of his salvation. So blessing and righteousness. You see how they go together? Why? Because... God blesses you according to your righteousness. But it's not really your righteousness, it's your obedience that's producing righteousness. So he's going to bless you according to your obedience. See, that's what's happening right now. There's this false arena where it's called false entitlement. People are wanting everything without doing anything. It doesn't work that way. They're wanting all of these things. They want God to do all of this stuff when they haven't completed what he's asked them to do. They want all of these entitlements. They want all free education. They want everything given to them. That's the generation right now that's coming up. That's what they're fighting for because of the Democratic Party that's been ruling because they love to just give everybody else's stuff away without it being earned. Does everybody get it? Now we got to break that off of everyone. Now we're coming out of that. So there's a lot of screaming and kicking and everything else going on. Amen? Amen. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the Jacob, the generation of those who what? Seek him, not self, but seek him and who seek your face. True seekers of true humility. When you become a true seeker, you become a true, you walk in true humility. All others is false humility, having a form of godliness, but denying his power. Only through death can the unction of the anointing come forth. Then there's something that begins to happen. And this is why we're talking about this today. I had to build a foundation first. When death is produced in you and you're able to receive the unction of the anointing, something is released. It's called a prophetic voice. Everyone say prophetic voice. Prophetic. Without the death of self and the anointing, the unction can't come and the release of a prophetic voice can't come either. God is raising us up for a prophetic voice. Does everybody understand? Go to Isaiah 40. I didn't say pathetic voice. I said prophetic voice. Because there's a lot of pathetic voices out there, but not prophetic. Isaiah 40, he prophesied because he has got a prophetic voice. In verse 1, Isaiah 40, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her. That her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So the prophetic voice is always preparing a way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. 
The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its lovingness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the, our Lord stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountains of Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid, says the cities of Judah before your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, he will reward, his reward is with him, he and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. This is powerful. There will be a release of prophetic voice from the anointing, unction. This release is because of true humility and the place where a person is dead to self and the world. In Mark chapter 1. Anyone here want to be a prophetic voice? Well, there should be that desire to be a prophetic voice. B.C., I was a pathetic voice. A.D., you become a prophetic voice if you stay filled, if you stay in position. Oh, glory. Verse 1, let's speak it. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it was written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in a wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John the Baptist was coming baptized in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all of the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate Nuts and honey. Locusts. I told you before, that's where the cereal came from. It came from John the Baptist. Nuts and honey. So he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. Is that called humility? Yes. I indeed baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So John was preparing the way for Jesus. Why? Because he was the voice, a prophetic voice. And that's what you and I are to be doing now. We are the prophetic voice in preparation for the Lord's return and warning of people, sharing them what's going on. People will get angry with you because you may, oh, you're judging me. Yeah, I'm judging. I judge everyone according to their fruit. That's what Jesus said, judge them according to their fruit. Amen? Amen. Jesus called them hypocrites. John called them brood of vipers. He exposed them. Hypocrites, pretenders, false humility. You know, when the Pharisees and Sadducees showed up, they challenged him. And he called them right out. Devils! He didn't take no garbage. Even Jesus sat at the table and said, there's a devil sitting here too. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Release of the prophetic voice of warning for the voice of harvest. Without warning, there's no harvest. Without repentance, there's no harvest. The purpose of warning is so that people will come to repentance and so harvest can come because people must get washed by the blood. You don't repent without humility. Now, there's false humility because there's sometimes not true repentance. They repent because they got caught, but there's really not true repentance. In Exodus chapter 3,
False humility to true humility. Death in a prophetic voice released by the anointing. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. The Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. When the Lord, so the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said to him, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. Moreover, he said, I am the Lord God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said to him, I, am, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. Egypt represents global bondage. It's called the house of bondage, ruled by Satan's kingdom. And I've heard their cry before their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Egypt was ruled by Nephilim, fallen angel race. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, because they thought they were gods, and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. These sites were all offsprings of Nephilim, every one of these tribes. That's why God wanted to kill them all. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the city of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. <laughs> But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children out of, of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now, Moses' heart changed. You got to remember, he came from a family of Pharaoh's. He was in a place of position. He was one of the leading Egyptians getting ready to lead and take position. Then he killed an Egyptian for abusing a Hebrew because his heart was changing. God was beginning before <clears throat> he, he, had, uh, he had false humility. He would watch someone get beat and abused. And as God began to draw his heart and began to draw him and he began to find out more and more uh, something, things that were going on that he was a Hebrew himself. Humbled him. Then he had compassion. See, true humility has true compassion. And he killed an Egyptian that was abusing a Hebrew. And he knew he couldn't stay there any longer and he took off. Then he was in the wilderness for for 40 years. And then the Lord visited him. I guess it took him 40 years to humble him really good. Sheesh. <laughs> and then, think, then he turned around. So before he, he, had, <clears throat> he had false humility until God began to draw him out. Then compassion began to tug at his heart in those beginning stages of true humility for the true God of Israel and Moses was anointed and granted a prophetic voice. Does everybody get it? Amen. He was anointed and granted a prophetic voice. To do what? To release, first of all, he was granted to release and prepare. He was granted to release the Egyptians, but he was preparing the way of the Lord to move in Egypt. That's where all the plagues and everything. God was bringing judgment on them so that his children could be released. Does everybody get that? Why do you think, oh, there's so much shaking going on now? 
There's so much shaking going on now. He's calling his children that have turned their backs to him and that are playing with death and hell, calling them back into position to the, so they can come to a place of death to themselves and the anointing can flow with a prophetic voice. Powerful. Remember the word Egypt represents bondage of the world. We're getting ready for exit ourselves. Hello? The rapture is the next feast to be fulfilled. The feast of trumpets. That's the next feast. We see right now that, which is powerful, I love it, because Trump don't give a hoot. Because he's anointed by God and he's releasing a prophetic voice. And he's fulfilling the desires of the Lord. And right now, it moving the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem. So what he's saying, Jerusalem. I mean, he's moving it. Yeah. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. He is proclaiming it. That's why there's all hell breaking out everywhere. Oh! But he's the only president that's been anointed to fulfill this. All of them spoke about it, but never did. Even Congress voted it on it years ago, but it never came to pass because the prophetic voice now is being released. Does everybody get it? Amen. Now is the time. It's happening right now. And we're a part of it. I love it. First Timothy 3. And so many are missing it. They're so caught up in themselves. First Timothy chapter 3. They're too caught up in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Caught up in fame and fortune. Building their own empire. Instead of expanding the kingdom of God. They're missing it. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. Work is, money has become people's gods. <clears throat> That's the idols. Let's speak in verse 14. But you must what? Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. That's what you must do. Okay. Verse 14. <laughs> These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but I am delayed. I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. His name is Jesus. Justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed in the world, and received up to glory. Again, Jesus was the prophetic voice. That's why he's called the anointed one and is anointing. Amen? Amen. He was the prophetic voice of salvation, of exposure, and of demonic forces <laughs> that take human lives in bondage today put people back into slavery just like with the time of Moses and, and with Egypt. Again, you're talking about the Nephilim race again. That's what you and I are battling. So you have the Nephilim race that is seen and the Nephilim race that is unseen, which is called demons. We're fighting these powers of darkness, all from fallen angels. And you and I are to drive these demonic forces out. That's why Jesus came to release the anointing for me and you. Amen? Now, the anointing releases the voice, the prophetic voice. Oh, glory. Go to uh, John 16. <clears throat> Hallelujah. John 16.
And then one more scripture. Glory to God. You know, cast out that false humility spirit. Just look in the mirror. If he winks, get rid of him. <laughs> Hallelujah. John 16 and verse 12. Let's speak it. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them or interpret them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, hallelujah, the spirit of truth. He, when he has come, he will do what? He's going to guide you to all truth. Who's the spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit. He's the carrier of the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty called the anointing. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will do what? He will tell you things to come. So whatever he hears, he speaks. And when he speaks to you, you become a prophetic voice and speak. He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All the things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said, he will take of mine and do what? Declare it to you. So we have no excuse, do we? Jesus released the Holy Spirit, the prophetic voice of today in me and you. Again, the formula is deny yourself, pick up the cross, fight, and follow. Everyone say, I'm called, I'm called. to battle. Yeah. My purpose yeah. is to destroy Satan's kingdom. Yeah. My destiny is to infiltrate the world system with a prophetic voice. 1 John chapter 2. Glory, and we'll close here. Is everybody okay? Did you bring your shovels? Glory, glory. In verse 15, is everybody there? Do not love the world or the things in the world. Is everybody there? Well, I'd gladly share the scripture with you. Would you share it with me? Good. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Can you do the will of God in your own strength? No. Only through the anointing. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming even now, many antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for they had been with us. They would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have a what? An anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. What a blessing that is. You and I know all things. The whole thing is this tapping into the anointing. That's, that's what it's about. Tapping into the anointing. That means you're going to have to die. You really got to come. You have to relinquish your own ownership. He bought you. You're not yours. Amen. And that's something that you and I got to battle with every single day. And every decision. And everything that we do, we must relinquish ourselves from ownership and bury ourselves every day so that we may stay dead in Christ, but live. Amen? Amen? Dead to self, alive in Christ. Why? So the unction of the anointing comes and a prophetic voice is released. Oh, glory. It's a promise to all of us who are willing to get in position. Amen?
Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We thank you for the call that you have on our lives. And you are requiring us these days to come to a, another level of death because your voice cries out and wants to cry out to your, through your people. So, Lord, we yield our voice, our will, and our desires, our past, our future, and our life into your hands and ask that you'll continue to work with us, keep us in position, kick us in the butt, whatever you got to do, cause us to come to a place of denial of self so that we can fight and release the unction of the anointing so that the release of the prophetic word can come through each and every one of us wherever we are with no fear, but knowing that a few before us who can be against us in Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody said amen. Praise God. Prepare your hearts for communion and you may bring tithes and offerings.